have your way Have your way O Lord Have your way Have your way Have your way O Lord Have your way O Lord Have your way Have your way singing that song, the Lord said to me, there are many of you I spoke to, you didn't obey me, you are not following my instruction. And as he said that, I remember uh, year 1999 when he said I should start Eagles Convention. And I disobeyed and ran away from him. Said, so how can you be asking me to do a conference where I'm feeding people? And I'm not charging any money. You are wicked. Me, I need money. You say I should be giving you. I ran away. As many as are like that today. The Lord is asking me to tell you. It is for your benefit. Every instruction the Lord is giving you. Is for your benefit. Since I began to obey God in 2000, my life, my ministry, everything started going up, 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 up because of obedience. So if you are here today and you have been struggling with God and you are winning God, you must allow God to win now. Let the will of God be done. So that you can move forward. Thank you, ancient of days. The greatest thing that we can ever do is to listen to you, to obey you, to follow your instruction. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to hear your voice. I pray that your voice will be clearer to us. Amen. I pray that understanding will be made available for us. I pray that courage to obey would also be granted unto every one of us. And our lives will not remain the same. Thank you, ancient of days. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Please the Lord Jesus. Okay, you may please sit down in the presence of God. Okay, I like you to. I, I want to read a story to you in Genesis chapter twenty-seven. Genesis chapter twenty-seven. That's a very popular story there. And the Lord began to speak some things to me from that story. He 
is just one small idea like this that God gave to me. And he said, I should share it today. So, I'm just going to be sharing from that story. Genesis chapter 27. I'll read it from verse 1. He says, Now it came to pass, when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim, that he could not see again, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it, and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats. And I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it. And that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. And I'm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. And I shall bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. Verse 13, But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth parts of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found this so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. You know, he didn't even think. (laughs) Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Verse 21, Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's. So he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? Because the spirit, his spirit was querying the subject. And he said, I am. He said, bring it near to me. Now we eat of my son's game. So that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him. And he ate. And he brought him wine. And he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, 
Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came and he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of the clothing and blessed him and said. So even the soul was deceived. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cause be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Verse 30. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that he saw his brother came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him. Ah, indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, oh my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master. And all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau asked a very special question. Verse 38. And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing? My father. Bless me, me also. Oh, my father. And then Esau recognized that he could have a second blessing. Oh, sorry. Jake, uh, Isaac. Remember that he could do another blessing. So he lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dews of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Praise the Lord. Okay, let me uh, set you down to what I want to talk about. I'm sure we know that the Bible is full of interesting stories. And this is one of them. This is a very interesting story. Isaac has zoomed that he was, it was time for him to die. You know, it was an assumption. Not that he saw a revelation. Not that God told him it was time to go. As a matter of fact, many years after this, he didn't die. But he thought he was going to die. So everything that took place here was just of the flesh. It's not God that told him to do it. He decided that, okay, I think I've done enough. Let me bless one of my children. I transfer grace and continue my journey to heaven. You know, sometimes as human beings, we find ourselves in situations like that. We are based on some things around you. Some circumstances happening to you. You make some conclusions. Say, that's what happened to, uh, what's, what's his name? Elijah. He said, am I better than my fathers? Let me die and go. He just concluded. 
and ended his grace before time. You know, sometimes like that, if we are not careful, we allow the flesh and circumstances to push us to do what we shouldn't do. Anyhow, the title of what I'm sharing, I call it the power of the venison. The power of the venison. The power of the venison. Venison. What is venison? You get to see what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, he has, there's a responsibility of transferring grace to the next generation. Abraham, when he was going to die, transferred grace to Isaac. You know, Isaac was the choice son of Abraham. And uh, he told the other ones, he had, you know, Abraham had other kids. Ishmael, and then maybe about five or six from Keturah. And he sent all of them away. He gave them gifts. He told them, Isaac is the son of, all of you are sons. Isaac is the son. Alright? You are also important too, but, uh, so he gave them gifts, each one of them. This is for you, this is for you, this is for you, this is for you. But every other thing I have is for Isaac. The land of Canaan, God gave it to me for inheritance. Isaac is the one that we have it. You go and create your own land. And that's, you know, that's the beginning of all those wars. All of those children that went away were angry with Abraham. Angry with Isaac. That's when you see the Amalekites. Amalek, Amalek is one of the sons of, uh, Keturah. You know, all of them are angry with Israel. How can you have every inheritance? And they gave us gifts. You know, that kind of thing. So, but Isaac now thought it was time for him to also go. And he wanted to transfer the covenant, the grace, to the son that would carry it on. He knew that it has to be one out of the two that he had. So, he gave a condition to the young man. Condition for receiving the grace. Now, this is significant for us because we have also come for exceeding grace. You want to receive grace also. So, we need to look at the examples in the word of God. Isaac told uh, his son, Esau, for you to receive this grace, you must bring me venison. Go and get some savory, some uh, animals he gave in the forest and make savory food for me, savory meat, so that I can eat it and enjoy it. And when I enjoy it, my soul will bless you. The grace will flow to you. Now, I found it very strange. Because when Abraham gave the same blessing to Isaac, he did not ask him to bring game. Let's go to look at it in Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25. I'll read from verse 1 to 6. Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leumim. And the sons of Midian were Epha, Epha Hanok, Abida, Elda. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac his son, to the country of the east. Look at, let's look, let's still look at verse 11. And it came to pass, after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac, 
And Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahai Roy. That is, God confirmed the blessing that Abraham gave to Isaac. So, Abraham sent away all the contenders while he was still alive. He blessed all of them quite well. That's why I was surprised when, uh, his, when Isaac was telling Esau uh, that Jacob has taken all the blessing. The fact that you bless one doesn't stop you from blessing the other. And thank God Esau was sensible enough to say, ah, did you, is there only one blessing in your mouth, my father? And bless me also. And then he said, okay. And if you look at that blessing that he gave to him, that is strong enough to carry anybody. Except that he now added that you will be a servant. <laughs> Which was not a blessing but an information. It was an information. Even though we don't like the idea but there's nothing you can do about it. There will always be somebody on top. And there will always be somebody down. Whether you like it, there's nothing you can do about it. Your fingers, are they equal? There's one that is taller than the other. And uh, it's not a cost that makes them smaller. It's reality. And I have discovered also that in, in, in life, God had made each person for specific positions. There was a time two, two followers, two disciples of Jesus... Two apostles wanted to corner Jesus and collect a special blessing. And they, you know, because they were his cousins, they went and recruited their mother. They brought their mother along. It's only one mother that gave birth to the two of them. And they came and met Jesus when there was no other person there. And said, Master, we want you to do something special for us. Promise that you will do it before we talk. Promise that you will do it. And the Lord said, tell me what you want. I will do it for you as long as it lies in my power. And he said, we want that one of us will sit to your right and the other to your left. Thank God that Jesus is not granted because they will start fighting. They will kill each other. Who will be on the right? Who will be on the left? It is me. It is you. It is me. They will kill each other. But Jesus told them something very important. He said, it is not in my power to give that to anybody. It had been reserved by my father. It is God, not Jesus, that lifts up one person and sets down another. Even among the disciples, there is somebody who had been uh, marked to be on the right. It had been reserved for him from the foundation of the earth. It's not anything they did that would choose them into that position. God has the prerogative of honor. He chose who has what and who does not have it. He also has the prerogative of time. Jesus does not know when he is going to come back. Only the Father knows. So the prerogative of time is with God, the Father. The prerogative of position is is also with the Father. So when he lifts up one person, he just pays you to accept God's verdict. You know, You are both qualified. And we are praying that God will use us. God use me. Please use me. And then God just pick one out of you and say, you are going to be an international evangelist that will be known all over the world. We were all praying together. We were like colleagues. And God just picked him among us. Can you grudge God? Oh, should you not be fighting with him because God chose him? That's what we do in the body of Christ now. We will not be fighting with him. Fighting with God that God did not choose you. 
You think he's something you didn't do or you did. No. It, it was reserved for him by the Father in heaven. I have discovered that there is no amount of struggle that you do if you are a fly. You can never become a mosquito. Okay? So there's no amount of jumping that the fly can do that will turn him into an eagle. There's a status that God has given to each person. You will get what I'm talking about as we go along. Alright? I say I'm sharing on the power of the venison. Isaac cannot decide who will receive the grace. But he thought by eating food he can receive a special unction to give that grace to somebody. And he created a lot of problems in his family. When he was released into that grace, Abraham did not demand venison or savory meat from him to end the blessing. So I wonder where Isaac got his own version, his own venison idea from. I just, I was just looking at that scripture. That day, the Lord began to open my eyes. He said, where did this man get this idea from? That somebody could go and kill meat and fry it and make it so fine. And then when you have eaten it, anointing will just flow. Anointing is a spiritual thing. Food is a carnal thing. It's a physical thing. How can they go together? In history, that event was not, it was not repeated by any of the patriarchs. When Jacob was going to release blessing, in Genesis chapter 48, he didn't ask uh, Joseph to bring venison. Let's go and look at it. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 48. And let's look at the incidents in verse 12 to 20. Joseph was told that his father was not well. And he was not well. And uh, he, he began to get agitated. For, ah, this Baba is about to die. Oh, let, me, let me take my children and go and greet him. Because some conversations, some conversations are taking place before. So he knew that his children were very crucial in the program of God. So he took his children... I'm reading now from verse 12. So just Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near him. Can we remember Ephraim and Manasseh? Who is the older? Manasseh is the older. And Ephraim is the younger. So, uh, Joseph assumed that the older, being Manasseh, should be on the right. So that he can receive the special blessing. And the younger, being Ephraim, should be on the left so that he could receive the smaller blessing. Then, verse 14, Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim on the left and stretched out the left hand and placed it on uh, Manasseh on the right. Let me let me read it exactly as it's written there. Verse 14, Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head who was the younger and his left hand on Manasseh's head guiding his hands knowingly for Manasseh was the firstborn and he blessed Joseph and said now it was Joseph he was blessing but it was they he laid hands upon he said God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked 
the God who has led me all my life long to this day, the angel who has de- redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Verse 17. Now when Joseph saw that the father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, he displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand and removed it to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Ah! This is the firstborn. You should have the thing. <laughs> verse, verse 18. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son. I know. He also shall become a people. And he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day. Saying, by you, Israel, we bless. Saying, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Praise the Lord. Now, that is another example of grace transfer. He was given to the younger. Even though the older also received a blessing. He said, the older will serve the younger. So it's not a matter of, and, but did you notice in any part of that story where he collected offering from them? Oh, did he eat any special meats to bless them? No. No, not at all. If you go further, you also see where Moses transferred grace to Joshua. You know, because Moses, he became too old to continue. And God said, you cannot go on. You have even offended me somewhere. And I don't want you to go further. I think God was realizing that Moses was going to become a god to the Israelites. They will begin to worship him. So God said, look, 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 you have to die. <laughs> I mean, you are a human being now, you must die. Die and come to heaven. So that you, <laughs> you join us in heaven. <laughs> and Moses was arguing, God said, it is that mountain, go there. And God came down to supervise the death of Moses by himself. In fact, the Bible said, it was God that buried him. Nobody knew the burial ground so that nobody can worship Moses. I'll tell you something. Moses was somebody to worship. Oh. He had become another thing entirely. The Bible said he was like a god to Pharaoh. Was he only to Pharaoh? Even among the Israelites, they cry for water, he gave them water. They cry for food, he gave them food. What, what else makes you a god? He handled everything. They were fighting. There were some enemies that came to fight with Israel. And the soldiers went to fight. The Bible said, when Moses lifted up his hand, they won. Each time he put his hand down, they lost the battle. He eventually, two grown-up men had to sit beside him to carry his hand. <laughs> the dimension of grace Moses was operating was beyond understanding. He knew things that people don't know. There were, there was a time the people were standing in front of him, large crowd of people, and they were talking and talking. He told Aaron, he said, go and put sensor, put, put, uh, incense into your sensor and go in between the people because the plague had started. How did he know plague had started? They got there and realized over several hundreds of people have died. It was large crowd he was leading. He didn't, how did he know all that was happening there? He was so anointed. 
carried the presence of God that was beyond human understanding. Even God said, there will never be another prophet like Moses that I will speak to mouth to mouth. Huh? He and God were talking mouth to mouth. He will sit down in the presence of God for 40 days, 40 nights. He won't even need food. He won't need food. That's what some of us want to try to do now. And they keep on, people keep dying anyhow. Because they are fasting beyond their capacity. Moses was not fasting, he was conversing with God. He just sat down and they were talking. And by the time he finished all the talking, Joshua, how many days have we been here? <laughs> and Joshua would say, ah, we came on, uh, it must be 40 days now. I said, eh? I thought it was yesterday. He was just enjoying the presence of God. But when it was time for him to go, because nobody will carry grace forever. I saw when my Baba was coming inside just now, and I told myself, one day I'll be like that. One day I'll be like that. That I would be going, and people would be holding me to steady my movements. Whether you like it or not, it go happen. Unless you know grow old. It's always like that. I was watching a movie, Kenneth Hagin was ministering. He was ministering. And the power came upon him. He was to minister to people. The power was going to make him fall. <laughs> and some, some young men were carrying him. Two on this side, two on this side, holding him as he is ministering to people. And people are feeling, you know, that kind of thing. He needed help in the old age. He was, by that time, he was 80 something, getting ready to die. Alright. So, when Moses realized it was time to go, he asked God, who will lead the people? And God told him it was uh, Joshua. And he had to lay hands on Joshua. Look at it in Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Let me read just verse, just verse 9 because of our time. He says, Now, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel headed I mean, he did him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Why was Joshua respected by the Israelites? Because Moses had laid his hands on him. Why was Moses, full, I mean, Joshua full of the spirit of wisdom? Because Moses had laid his hands on him. How much did that laying on of hands cost Joshua? How much did he pay Moses? Ah, I was in, we were in Accra, Ghana. I am sure one of you was with us, if not both of you. We were in Accra, Ghana. And uh, we went to do Eagles Convention. The fellow who hosted us was a bishop. He faced me, he said, Papa, he said, I'm his father. I'm pastor, he's bishop, I'm his father. He said, Papa, on Sunday, I'm going to be ordaining people. And I need you to join me. We were still going to be there on Sunday. So I said, it's alright. Since I was going to preach, you want to ordain people, okay, I'll join you. I will honor you with that. So on that day, he sat me on the altar like this. He sat... He sat somewhere there, sat me on the altar, Tebarati like that. One big, big chair like this, Papa's chair. <laughs> so I, I sat and I was wondering if I could feel that chair very well. <laughs> so I sat there and he was bringing up the people he wanted to ordain. He would bring somebody and say, this fellow is to be ordained as, pa- as pastor. And then he would look at it and say, ah, his words, uh, 
to 20,000 CD. I, I can't remember their money. Before I can ordain him, all his friends, all his family, you must pay that money now. I've never seen it before. But I am Papa now. <laughs> I'm just watching. <laughs> I'm just watching. So they paid the money. All the people, he didn't have. All his people, they will gather together, look for money, so that the money will be up to what he spoke about. After he collects the money, he said, hey, he is ready for the nation. And then they will recite what they need to recite, and they will call Baba to come and lay hands. And I'll go there and lay hands. Like a puppet. I was just wondering, what is this about? But because we were trying to relate, I, I couldn't say anything. I even thought at the end he would share part of the money with me. <laughs> the guy just said, thank you, Papa. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord, though. Strange things that we brought into the body of Christ. I just wonder if it was Moses that needed money for the grace he carried. How much will Joshua need to pay for that grace? Okay. So we saw that Moses laid hand on Joshua without collecting a pay. I read also Elisha receiving grace from Elijah. He did not have to slaughter an animal. He did not have to give a special offering no, to get a double portion of the grace upon Elijah. In Second Kings chapter 2. Let's look at it also. Second Kings chapter 2. From verse 9 to 12. You know, what I'm sharing now is very important because our own generation must not fall into the pit of our fathers. We must not fall into the pit of the fathers. What we are dealing with in Africa today is the error of fathers. And this is one of the errors. We must deal with it so that we can continue. We have to transfer grace to the younger generation coming after us. How, how do they transfer grace? Let's, I think we need to pay attention to what is done in the Bible. What was done in the Bible. Look at it from verse 9. 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 9. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Now, you need to understand that question. Elijah was expecting that Elisha would ask for money. He was expecting that Elisha would ask for some physical thing. Ask whatever you want. I am the prophet of God. I can make things happen for you. You need a healing, I will give it to you. You need a deliverance, I'll give it to you. you. What do you need? I'll give it to you. And Elisha, very intelligent young man who had, who was so focused, he knew what he wanted. He had been rich before. You know, when he, he got the calling, when they, when they threw mantle upon him, he was a farmer that had about, about seven tractors, twelve tractors working for him. Twelve yokes of oxen. That's, each one of them was a tractor. So you can imagine a farmer that has 12 tractors working. That's not a small farmer, you know. And uh, to move, he slaughtered all of those animals. And distributed it to people. So he was a wealthy person who was used to distribution before. So when he said, what do I do for you? He didn't say, I need money. I've handled money before. That's not what I want. He said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There is somebody who has this persistent headache. Persistent. He's been there for some time. 
and the Lord wants us to sort it before we go on. If you are that person, please come forward. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Servants of God, just stretch your hands towards him and pray. It's not me alone that will pray. We break the power of that headache. Klaba Shatari Hose Pradi So pretty your Satan dear We break the power of that headache in the name of Jesus We break the power of that headache in the name of Jesus Klabo se pradi you not see it again forever in the name of Jesus Salivere no she padi asantele boni son tre die kasadia We break the power of that headache in the name of Jesus You are free Blessed be your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Alright. So Elisha asked, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And Elijah was surprised. What kind of request are you making? Look at the way he answered in verse 10. So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Uh uh-uh. uh. How can you be asking for double of what I have? I don't have power to give you double. Even if you want what I have, I can't give you. You are asking for double what I have. It's like, it's like you met somebody who has 50,000 in his pocket. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, give me 100,000. Uh uh-uh. I don't have what you are asking for now. That's what happened there. And then he remembered that this is a spiritual matter. So he said, nevertheless, even though I don't have the power, there is somebody who gave me the 50,000. There is somebody who gave me this anointing that you won't double off. He is coming to take me now. When you see me as I go, he will give you. In essence, Elijah was transferring that responsibility to the Holy Spirit. Not that he gave him double portion. He didn't have the double portion to give. You don't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. Can you? Ah, you say, I, I, I give you five million. In your account, you have five, 50,000. How can you give me five million? Which kind of five million? He said, nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, then of course you must have seen the person who is taking me. He shall be so for you. But if not, he shall not be so. Then it happened. As they continued, and as they were talking, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, whirlwind is one of the ways the Holy Spirit operates. He went up by the whirlwind. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, My father, my father. The chariot of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he believed the word that was said to him. So he took hold of his own clothes that represented his servanthood. And tore them into two pieces. You know, in those days, the clothes you wear must mani- must represent who you are. So, what he was wearing was the garb of a servant. So, now that his master has gone, he tore that cloth. I'm no longer a servant. And then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and put that upon himself. I have replaced my master. And he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? They said, If I saw you, I will have it. Where are you? And the God of Elijah answered. The Bible said, When he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that way. And Elijah, Elisha crossed over. Praise the Lord. Now he did not pay money for that, that grace. He did not give a special offering for it. 
He did not slaughter any animal to receive it. Let me give one more. Jesus Christ. When he was going away, he did not ask for offering from his disciples to receive the grace that he carried. Abby, he carried grace, you know. I'm sure we know that Jesus carried grace. How God anointed, according to Acts chapter 10 verse 30, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. He had the anointing. And when he was about to go, he told his disciples, you cannot survive without the anointing. In Luke chapter 24 verse 49, he told them, tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. Tarry. You must wait in the presence of God. He didn't say, bring a fat offering so that you can receive the anointing that I carry. Tarry, tarry in the place of prayer until you are endowed with power from on high. And then in Acts chapter 1, let me read that one from verse 4 to 5. Acts chapter 1 from verse 4 to 5. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. And look at verse 8 also. He says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He didn't say you will receive power when you give me an offering. He didn't say you will no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will bring power. He will enable you. Even when Jesus himself received the Holy Spirit, it was John that, laid, that, that, that anointed him. What offering did he give to John? There was no record of anything like that. Okay. Now, there was a place where this same idea of venison came up. In Acts chapter 8. Venison came up in Acts chapter 8. Verses 18 to 21. I hope you are listening to what I'm sharing. Because that's what God spoke to me. Oh. He says, and when, I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 8 from verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands I mean, of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money. Can you see venison? He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them money. He said, Egba. Abiyoto, if it's not enough, I will go and look for more. Take money. Give me this same power so that anyone I lay my hands upon may receive the Holy Spirit. What was Peter's response? Verse 20. For Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You thought that you can purchase the grace of God with venison. Your venison perish with you. You don't buy grace with money. You don't buy spiritual things with carnal things. Oh, you gave me a car. That's the reason why you will have grace. No. They don't go together. You say you have, verse 21, you have neither part nor portion in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. So whenever venison becomes the subject in grace, the heart is not right. The heart is not right. 
And what did he tell him? Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray that God, maybe God will, will, will show mercy upon you and forgive you. That man called Simon was a sorcerer. He was a sorcerer before that day. He just gave his life to Jesus Christ. So he didn't understand the way of the gospel. He didn't understand the way of the gospel. And he felt, ah, ah, money buys everything. Money is the answer to all this. So he came and said, this grace. Now he saw miracles, so he saw healing, so that one didn't interest him. But this, this one that is making people to be speaking in tongues. <laughs> That is making people to fall down. Ah, I like this one. And he gave them money. Yes. See, this is good money. And if you want, I will raise dollar. Just give me this one. This particular type. That's the one I want. He wants to buy grace. Okay? So we saw how Peter rebuked him sharply. Now, in the story of Isaac that we read, that's the patriarch who brought the covenant release to the carnal level of venison. It ended in shame and sorrow because he was easily deceived. They deceived him and he, wrong, he gave it to a wrong person, even though, even though you can put that wrong in uh, inverted commas. We know that God actually wanted Jacob to have that blessing. But he, because he was a carnal man, was looking at the fact that, ah, this one always brings me good food. So he's the one who should have it. So he was going to give that blessing to the wrong person. But the important thing there that I want you to see was that he was deceived because he was operating at the carnal level. In the carnal realm, deception is so easy. When you want to level spiritual grace to the level of carnality, the result, the end result is that you are going to be deceived. And if you go to ministries where that is happening now, where when you give good offering to Papa, Papa will give glory to you. What you will discover is that you see so much of evil happening there. People who are not qualified for leadership, they are being placed in position. Why? Because they gave fat offerings. They gave great gifts to the servants of God. And they say, ah, <laughs> That car I'm driving is the one that bought it. Let him be ordained as pastor. So you see people who are not qualified, who are not meant to be in positions, they are being put because they have money to throw around. That's not the way of the Bible. So whenever you begin to bring spiritual things to carnal level, you must expect expect deception, a lot of deceptions. In our generation, this error is manifesting heavily and we must deal with it. I went to invite an elderly preacher to speak in this convention. I wanted to ask him to come and speak to us in this convention. Some years passed. It was an elderly man. If I mention his name, most of us we know, but it's an old man. I just felt these people are finishing. Before they go, let them, let them transfer some of this thing they carry. Even if it is just knowledge that we have from them, it's something. Information, things like that. So I went and tried so hard to get the Baba. I tried so hard that I want to speak with the Baba. And they said, well, before you can speak to Baba, you must talk with his chief of staff. He's the only one who can allow you to see Baba. Chief of staff. Even that title quickened me a little bit. Chief of staff. <laughs> and then eventually they 
I had access to the chief of staff. Is that, no, seeing the chief of staff was an assignment on his own. Because he was a big man there, you know. When I finally got into his office, and I, I, he was happy to see me because I look distinguished. So, but when I told him what I came for, he was not happy. He said, Baba is old. Baba is too old. He won't come for your program. It is me we send. I, I cannot argue with that because I don't know how Baba operates. So I said, that's all right. Let me see him, sir. He said, what do you want to see him for again? Invite me straight away. You don't need to see Baba. It is me. If you see Baba, it is me we send. Now you have seen me. Invite me myself now. Even the way he was talking, he has already disqualified himself from invitation. How can I, how can you be telling me to invite you? God told me to come and see Baba. You say I should invite you. While I was still trying to take, I mean to talk on that. His phone, his phone began to ring. So, you know, phone has become a, a god that we always, that supervise, supersedes everything. The moment the phone began to talk, I kept quiet and he carried the phone. Hello? And that one said, hello sir, uh, something, something. I didn't know what they were saying, but I had his own part of the conversation. And he said, is it Tony or something? He woe woe. And that one said, Tony, Tony, Tony woe. Do do a big pa. I was, you know, when you are listening to such conversation, you begin to wonder, Egba Mio. Do do a big pa. And say, ah. And that one said he wants to come and see him tomorrow. Shori toba marry me. He should talk boni wa gbeda ni o. Toba muwe bon to da wa fun baba o niri mi o. Ba ma walo la wa muwe fri to da to da ti ma ti no mi adon si e. Otherwise mi o niri e o. I just said thank you, sir. And I carried my iPad and I left his office because I just don't know what I want to invite in that fellow. And if Baba is going to send him, then I better run so that mistakenly will not be the one that will come. Uh, but that's the kind of thing happening now. You want to see me, you must bring huge offering. You want to see Baba, you must give me offering. Most of those big, big men of God, you want to see them, you must be ready to bribe your way. You must bribe your way. They don't call it bribe. It is offering. You give offering, offering through your way. It's not bribery. It is offering through your way. You'll be giving them offering as you are going. To open door for you. To see Baba. What I don't know is whether all those babas know about it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure someone will argue with me that Saul took offering with him when he went to see somewhere. Is that not true? True, very true. But that was only on the first day. Nothing was said about offering on all the subsequent meetings. In fact, even in that first meeting, there is no proof that Samuel actually took their offering. Because the entire conversation they had was written in the Bible. And there was no reference to the offering. 
Even though they had it, they told themselves, we have something to give. We will give him this. There was no section in that story where they gave him that offering. And uh, by the way, assuming Samuel even took the offering on that first meeting, it was not Samuel who asked for the offering. Oh. It was not a, 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 a venison. It was not that Samuel said, before I will make you king. Huh? King, king, you want to be king? Ah, you must shake camel and walk it. You are looking for donkey. You are looking for donkey. Go and bring ten cows. And then I will ordain you as king in Israel. There was no record. It wasn't that he demanded for an offering from him. It was, and if he gave that original one, it will have been a free will offering, which was not a condition for any relationship, it was not a condition for anointing. As a matter of fact, if you study that story very well, Samuel hosted Saul that day and his servants. They slept in his house and he gave them sumptuous meal. In fact, when they set the, the meat in front of Saul, he was shocked. Yeah. Kilo de? Emini kon? They said yes, because you are now special in Israel. They had reserved it for him. It was meant to be for the priests. Was reserved for him. Big meat, part of the sacrifice that was offered. Saul ate it. And swallowed it completely. And then he went and slept in Samuel's guest chalet. And Samuel did not collect any money for it. He didn't charge for anything. I think that's how, that's how to be graceful as a spiritual father. Take care of them. Give them what you have. Not that you are preying on people who come to you. When David was anointed, let me add another one. When David was anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I will not read it. I will not read it because of our time. In First Samuel chapter 16, when David was anointed to become king, there was no reference to any venison, neither. From David. That's, ah, okay, oh, David, you are the one chosen. Now, before we proceed, this is how much you will go and get. If you sell like 10 cows, maybe you raise the money. In fact, it was obvious that Samuel never met David before. He was meeting him for the first time. He said, do you still have another child? He said, yes, there's one. But he's in the wilderness taking care of the sheep. He said, go and bring him. We will not sit down until he comes. And as he came inside, Samuel recognized him, not because he knew him before, but because the Spirit of God said, that is him. Anoint him. So instantly, the boy even didn't know what was happening. They poured oil on him. Didn't pay anything for it. So, I mean, it, it, it's, that's the way of the Bible. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it is wrong to give to servants of God. It's a good thing to give to servants of God. And it has a lot of rewards. He who honors a prophet will not lose a prophet's reward. It's good to give to servants of God. As a matter of fact, if you give to me as a person, I will gladly accept it too. If I'm sure that you are a believer, I will accept it. Unless God specifically tells me not to collect it. The iPad I'm using is a gift somebody gave to me. I was preaching in Lagos and a lady came. She just, we have been talking on the phone before. And she said, sir, I'm coming to Nigeria and I, I would like to see you. I said, I don't have space to for, for, for see you. All. Ah, I said, I must just see you. I must just see you. And I said, okay. I'll be preaching in Lagos in so so and so church this time. That's the only time I might be able to see somebody. 
He said, that is excellent. So when I arrive Lagos, I will not leave Lagos until that meeting. I'll see you before going to my destination. That's all right, oh. I just answered off and like, like that. And then the next thing, she came and, uh, hey, daddy, this is for you. In fact, in the midst of the crowd, I was, I didn't know who the person I was talking to was. Until she identified, I said, oh, it is you. And then she gave me this iPad. I said, oh, beautiful. And uh, the Holy Spirit did not say, don't take it. Just as he's not saying, don't use it now. So I'm using it and I'm enjoying it and I'm blessing her. And surely she shall be blessed. So it is good to collect, to give offering to servants of God. But what I'm saying is this. It is not a condition for anything from me. If you give me an iPad so that I can give you grace, you are a joker. Can you ask somebody to give what he doesn't have? Am I the owner of grace? You still don't understand what I'm saying. I will see, we will still get to it. What I'm saying is that gift is not a condition for grace. It is very wrong for a servant of God to demand venison for a blessing. It is even a foolish thing for a servant of God to focus on venison. Because if you do, you will run into a major confrontation with the Lord. Like Balaam did. Balaam was an example of somebody who loved venison. You know, you remember Balaam now. Balaam was the man who was on one side a prophet, on another side a sorcerer. And when you listen to the grace, or you pay attention to the grace of Balaam, you will see that he was not just a prophet, he was a choice prophet. The kind of things he was saying, you will know that he was operating a strange dimension of grace. But because he loved venison, he loved the gifts of, of men. He couldn't go far. He died like a sorcerer. Because he disobeyed God for venison. Balak said, if you come, I will bless you so much. And he loved that blessing. That gift that Balak, Balak was going to give him. That made him to run contrary to God. He died as a sorcerer. Now in trying to conclude, let me, let me try and begin to conclude what I'm sharing. I have discovered that only God gives grace. Because no one can receive anything except it is given from above. It is what God gives that we can gather. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let me show you some verses, some information from some verses there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting from verse 4. It says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Okay. I, I think I, I wanted to stop at 7. Now go to verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as uh, he wills. Are you reading with me? As what? As who wills? Capital H. He wills. As he wills. 
not as I wish. As he wish. As he wills. I know people who have been deceived to assume that they could receive grace by following and by giving uncommon offerings to some servants of God in anticipation of special graces that they operate. I know many. I met a minister who was I mean somewhere in the in the US. And he's a very wonderful man. Had a great work going on there. And we were in a conversation. And he told me how he had been frustrated in ministry. Because he saw a certain bishop and the way the bishop was operating. The dimension of grace that bishop was operating by. He said that bishop had grace for crowds. And he wanted that grace. You know, I don't know where we got all those ideas from. He saw that bishop had grace for crowd. And he said, I want that grace. So he wanted to have that grace. And he investigated, how can he have it? And they told him he must interact with that bishop to have the grace. He must submit to that bishop to have that grace. He must give that bishop uncommon offerings to have that grace. He was, he lived in America. The bishop was in Nigeria. So he made it a point of duty. At least in a month, he will fly it into Nigeria three times. Three times in a month to attend meetings in that bishop's church. If they were doing a convention, he must be there. If they were doing a special meeting, he must be there. If they said they are doing VG, he must be there. If they are not doing any special program, three meetings in a month. To the extent that the bishop recognized him, he said, this man, who are you? And he told him that he was a pastor. From, he said, okay. So like that, there was a relationship that was uh, developed. And every meeting, as he shows up, the bishop will say, you are here again. The bishop himself, in the midst of thousands, began to recognize the man. And he said, he gave every time he came like that, he brought fat offerings in dollars for the bishop. For the bishop. Grace, grace, grace. He pray and pray, cry, cry. Bishop lay hands on him, lay leg on him. He did all kinds of gymnastics upon him, but nothing happened. Nothing. At the time we were talking, he was already frustrated. He said, you mean I wasted all my money and my time? His congregation was less than 100 people. And he was connecting with grace for crowd. But that, that grace did not flow to him. Several ministries have been destroyed. Gradually. Because they have promoted this venison idea strongly. Say so before anyone can make any progress there, they must be ready to give heavily. Some years ago, when my ministry was just starting, and we were battling with teaching problems, and those problems were beyond teaching, actually. They were, they were really, really serious problems. We were, I was, you know, we were down, 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 down. Money was difficult. Thank God for my parents who used to be supportive and my wife, my family who could accommodate so much. It was really, really tough for us. At that point, there was a particular point when the thing got so terrible. Oh yeah, we had food to eat but I was not happy. 
not that I knew in the I you know, Yoruba, you know the difference between the two? Uh-huh. So I said, there must be a solution to my, to this problem. I thought it was a problem. I didn't know that they were just normal experiences that everybody goes through. Every good thing, you will go through the beginning phase. When there is no help, when you cry and nobody hear your voice. There will be a time like that. When you go through that, don't think that something is wrong with you. No! You are starting life. At that time, I thought everything was wrong with me. I thought I was caused. I thought something was wrong with my ministry. I thought something was wrong with everything. So I felt, what should I do? I said, there must be a man of God that can speak into my life. So I looked in the nation. Which one of them has that great cloud, clouds that can, that can change my situation by speaking? And I picked one bishop. I said, that man can do it. So I drove to his uh, church. I got there, packed my, my, my jalopy. And I went down. I, in fact, arriving there already gives me satisfaction. Come and see beauty everywhere. I say, ah, today my life will turn around. I, after inspecting around, I now made effort to see the, the person. Because if I begin to call, call his title, maybe you, may, you begin to think who, who I was talking about. I said, I want to see the Baba. So I went to his, to the place that I felt looked like an office. And I saw a number of people who were well dressed. I told, I greeted them. Yeah, they, they greeted me like I was. I was too small to them. And they said, what do I want? I said, I want to see Baba. The guy looked at me and he laughed. You know the way it is now. Somebody you never met before. And you just say, I want to see. And the first thing he's doing is laughing at you. Ah, why are you laughing at me? Am I so ridiculous? And then he laughed more. Ah. To worsen the matter, he called another person. He said, come, 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 come. Come, I hear, wait here, I hear. Ha. <laughs> come, on, here, wait, I hear, wait here, I hear. And then three people gathered around us. Thank God they were all men, anyhow. Thank God they were all men. And he said, this man said he wants to see Baba. And all of them began to laugh. And I asked myself, what I said, was it that ridiculous? And then one of them took pity on me and explained what they were laughing at. He said, you don't see him like that. You don't see him like that. I said, I know. I know that you can't just walk in to see him. I expect that you will show me his secretary so that I can fill some documents and start a process. Even if it will take me one month, two months, at least let me start the process of seeing him. They say, you can't see his secretary. Ah. I said, I don't understand. And he said, okay, let me help you. He said, you want to see him? I said, yes. He said, this is what you should do. You go and get good offering. Good offering. And when I say good, I mean good. Sell whatever you need to sell. Good offering. Put it in a good envelope. Make sure that it is showing in the envelope. So you bring it when you are coming. Like today, now if you have brought it, 
we can allow, we will allow you, we will help you to do what you should do so that you can see him. But because you don't have it, go and get it. On the day you bring it, this is what will happen. He told me, he said, very soon now, in another two hours, he's going to arrive. He said, he's not here now. But in two hours time, he's going to arrive. He said, when he comes, there will be about 20 or 40 cars following him in his entourage. He said, as he's coming in, eh, there will be plenty soldiers, plenty uniformed people around that will surround him as he's coming down from the vehicle. He said, the way you will do it is, you will run to him. But you hold your envelope so that everybody will know you are not bringing bomb. It is offering you want to give him. So you will run to where he is and grab his leg and give it to him. He said, if God has favored you, he will collect it from you. And he will walk away. He said, but you must put your information inside the envelope. So after he collects your offering, goes away, he will see your note inside it. And then he will now communicate with you. But if God does not favor you, they didn't add that I was the one that asked them. Because they said, if God favor me. So I said, what if God does not favor me? They said, you will receive some beatings. So I, I check, I look at myself. I was better the way I was than what I will become if they beat me up in that place. <laughs> Besides, what do I have to sell? I was struggling to eat. Struggling to survive. I wanted somebody to help me, to pray for me. Now he said I should go and bring fat offering. From where? Where will I get it from? So I entered my car and drove back. From that place, I cried to Ibado. I wept that day. If I even now, I'm still feeling like weeping. Because my life was in a crisis. I was suffering. I thought this was a man of God that could solve my problem. That could help. At least for him to even say, son, don't worry. It will be all right. And that's the way we suffer when we started. There's a way a story can encourage you to go on. He said that I should go and bring fat offering. I came, I came to Ibado. And I prayed. When I got to Ibado that day, I said, Lord, they say I can't see the man who should bless me. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, you don't need any blessing. You are already blessed. You are already blessed. Stop being lazy. Get up and pray. If you can pray, the doors will open. You will move forward in life. It is you who can pray the prayer. Not any man's blessing. We used to live in Akpata at that time. I woke up to prayer. My wife will remember. 4 a.m. I will get up. I will hit the road. I begin to pray. Like a madman. And people will clear out of the way for me. As I'm walking on the road. They thought a new madman has come. I will do that until the time I will come and bath and take my children to school. I drop them in school. I go to another place to go and pray. Pray like a madman. Like a madman. I kept on praying. I kept on praying. I kept on praying. I kept on praying. 
prayed myself out of the ditch. Prayed myself into limelight. Prayed myself into where God. That's how I develop a lifestyle of praying. And then it got to a point God began to make covenants with me. He was in the place of prayer. Not visiting any man of God somewhere. Loiter around the place and they, they know you. They, as soon as you come, they say, ah, that one, he has come again. He wants to see Baba. 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 And in the process of seeing Baba, you receive all kinds of evil spirits. You begin to beat your wife. You begin to misbehave. You don't know where the thing came upon you. You don't tell them Baba Yakiri. Following them around. You don't know the spirit they are operating by. You don't know who called them. You were not there when they were called. Excuse me, who lay hands on Baba Lola before he enter into grace? Some of them are telling, talking to you about the grace they can give to you. Who gave them the grace? Who? Pray, Joe. Go and meet the one who has the grace. Please, oh, don't misunderstand me. Oh. I'm not saying that they are no great men of God, though. And I'm not saying it is wrong for them to pray for you. Prayer is good. Get as much of it as you can get. But all this uh, uh, looking for venison to get, mm, forget about it. Unfortunately, now I am confronted with people who assume that I'm qualified to release such grace upon them. And they are placing all kinds of demands upon me. I don't have grace to distribute. No one does. No, the Holy Spirit is the only one who gives grace. He's the one who uses his servants to distribute. And most often, those servants may not even know the moment the grace will go out from them. In which year was that? I can't even remember the precise year. I, I was in Togo doing a crusade. I was doing crusade in some villages in Togo. And uh, my host said, you know T.L. Osborne is coming to Lume. And I said, ah, T.L. Osborne is coming. He said, he's coming. Ah, that's interesting. But I'm busy. I went to my room, the place where I was to sleep that night. The Holy Spirit said, He is coming because of you. I said, Because of me. I don't understand. He said, I arranged both of you to meet here. Because I need you to go and see him. I said, I can't see him. See a lost born like me. Ah, ah. How can I see him? He said, Big man. Why would I be able to? He said, Don't worry. I will arrange you to see him. Just cancel that schedule and be there. Be in that conference. He was doing a minister's conference. And he said, I should go. So I went there. As I arrived in the conference, come and see crowds of people. See, I lost one man. The whole place was crowded. And I found a place at the back to sit down. As I sat, the Holy Spirit said, this is not your place. I said, where is my place? He said, get up. So I got up. And he led me. He said, follow this side. And I followed. Kept on going, kept on going, kept on going. And then I busted out one door like this. He said, enter through that door. I entered. Just like a pair seat there. There was one seat in that corner that was empty. He said, that is your seat. So I sat down. And Taylor Osborne began to talk. He was, I mean, just as I sat down, he just arrived into the hall. Old man, but energetic. Began to talk and talk and talk and talk. As he was talking, I wasn't even hearing what he was saying. The Holy Spirit was saying, be watching him. 
be watching him. So I was watching. I was watching, watching, watching. Suddenly, he began to say some things. The Holy Spirit said, in the next minute, he will be stepping out. He will pass this door. He will pass this door. Can you see that car over there? That's the car we enter. Go and stand beside the car. I said, okay. So I got up and I went to the car. And I stood there. It was, I didn't even know he had finished. He didn't do any grace. He didn't do it. He just dropped the microphone for his, uh, people to continue. He just walked out. He alone just came to meet me by the car. He said, my brother, how are you? <laughs> and I introduced myself. I said, I'm this person. I'm this, I'm that. And he hugged me. He said, you have what I have. Go do it. Go do it. The way the man heard me, he was like a bear head animal. <laughs> By that time, he was 80 something years old. So strong. Ah. He said, you have what I have. Go and do it. And he entered the car. And the driver, I said, the driver was already inside. The driver didn't even leave the car. As he hugged me, he just entered the car and left. And the car just left. People started jumping out. They wanted to see him. He had gone already. Interesting experience. Throughout that night, I couldn't sleep. You, you, you have what I have. Go do it. Ah, go do it. The thing was just echoing in my head. Go do it. Go do it. Men of God who gives grace, they don't, they, they don't plan it. They don't say, I'm going to give grace today. Say, tomorrow is a special day of our grace. Oh yeah, come, bring venison. No. That was the first time I was ever meeting him in person. And that was the last time I met him. A few days later, a few months later, he was dead. At another time, I was getting ready for our ministry's anniversary. <laughs> and as my custom, I was discussing with God the plan for that program. We were going to invite Baba Ryuki to come. Like we are expecting Baba to come today now. He should be speaking after me. But that day we were, I was, I was planning to invite him to come and speak in our anniversary. Suddenly the Holy Spirit said, call, and he mentioned somebody's name, to minister at the anniversary. I, of course I know that name. But I don't have any inkling how to get the person. And I told the Holy Spirit, I don't know how to get this person you are talking about. So. And instantly he said, tell, tell Ori, okay, I said that. And he would connect you with him. I said, okay, Lord. So I called Baba Ori, okay. I said, hello, sir. This is what God told me. Ah, he said, that's great. Bishop, so, so, and so. He is in... And he told me his address. He told me how to get him. When I can go there to meet him. He said, if you go so, so, and so time, you will meet him. Ah, okay, sir. And when you get there, tell him, what's the echo? Tell him that, um, I sent you. So I went to the Baba's place. It's an elderly man with a big name. Got there. He was doing a meeting like this. So I joined in and I enjoyed myself. At the end of it, I went to see the Baba, greeted him, and told him who I was. Oh, he said, Doctor, you okay? Huh? And, you know, instantly that opened the door for our discussion. I said, Since you came from Doctor, you okay? I will come for your meeting. I will come. What is the date? I gave him the date. And he came. And it was a good meeting. 
But after that meeting, I began to hear all kinds of bad stories about the Baba. Stories of immoralities and so on. And I'm a very tough person when it comes to issues like that. I don't associate with it. So when I had those things, I just, I, I, I just cut it off. I said, no, I don't want to talk with that man again. And the Holy Spirit said, I told you to relate with this man. I said, he is an adulterer. I was told he's an adulterer. The Holy Spirit said, you are my servant. You follow my instructions. Go and get him to come and speak in Eagles Convention. I said, the man is dirty, Lord. He said, you don't tell me who is dirty. I tell you who is dirty. Call him to come and speak. I don't want to go to all the details. So I called the Baba. When I got to his uh, venue, I mean his place to invite him for the meeting, he laughed. He said, I know you will come. And I know you don't want to come. <laughs> but I know the Holy Spirit will not let you have peace. He will tell you to come and ask me to come. You know, when the Holy Spirit was telling me I should bring him, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said, there is no, it's not a special teaching that he's going to do. He has stories to tell you. He has stories to tell you. So when he was now answering me that day and he laughed, and then he said, you know, People like us, we don't, we don't need to teach you the word of God, but we have stories to tell you. So I said, <laughs> So I So he began to, he minister, came a few times. One day the Holy Spirit said, you know, I sent you to that man because I have a luggage with him that I want you to collect for me. He has a limited time to leave. And I need you to take my luggage from him. So I said, luggage. How do I know your luggage? So that I can collect it. How can I collect it, by the way? He said, that's not your business. Your business is to always go when I ask you to go. And do what I ask you to do. So, the Holy Spirit was instructing me. Go and see him. Go and do this. Go and do that for him. Go and do that for him. And I kept on doing what he said I should do. And then one day he came for our minister's meeting like this. After I finished preaching. I said, Baba. I want to request that you should lay hands some of you were there that you should lay hands on everybody that is a head of a ministry here and give us grace he took the microphone from me he said I don't do that kind of thing he was speaking Yoruba Amy is Amy is it in a <laughs> and he said, I should come out. And he laid hands on me. And he prayed. And he left. That night, I had an uncommon experience. I was in a throne room and the Lord was seated on the throne Ulua and there were plenty people in the room human beings now and he was giving them instructions I was a tiny boy in one corner tiny boy in one corner 
Insignificant. There were important people there. He was giving them instruction. You, you take the money there. Go and do the assignment I gave you. And that one will say, yes sir. And he will go and take the money. Come and see, they, pa- they display money like this. That's the day I knew that the Lord is not, is not, uh, broke. He's not broke at all. He has plenty of money. Come and see money everywhere. And you just tell him, take that money, go and do the assignment. You, that vehicle that I gave you, go and use it. And, do, and everybody's saying, yes sir, yes sir. There was no reference to me. I was so tiny in one corner there. And all of a sudden, he called one. You, take the vehicle and go and do this. He didn't finish it before the guy began to answer. Him you Lord, me Lord. I will not go. I will not go. I'm tired of doing this your work. This work that you don't you 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 you, you use people and you don't you don't take care of us. I will not go. I will not do it. I was so shocked. The entire throne room was silent. All the movement stopped. Ah. The way that fellow spoke to the Lord. It's like the comment of that unfaithful servant, that one that was given one uh, talent. Ah! I was shivering where I was. I was waiting to see what the Lord would say. He didn't say anything. He just spoke to another person. And as if nothing happened. And they began to do things. So, I just found myself in that revelation. I raised my hand and stepped forward. Excuse me, sir. The work you said that man should go and do that he said he will not do. I want to do it, sir. Yeah, I'm talking of revelation. That's what I saw. And he said, can you do it? I said, I will try, sir. I can try, sir. He said, okay. Go and take the vehicle and go and do it. Thank you, sir. And I stepped out of the place. And I, as I went out, it was a large compound. And there were plenty of vehicles there. But somehow, I knew the vehicle that he was talking about. Even though nobody pointed it to me, I knew the right vehicle. I just went there and started cleaning the vehicle. As I was cleaning the vehicle, another person that was looking exactly like the Lord, Exactly like him, but not him. Because he looks a little older than the one on the throne. Because even in that revelation, I was calling him Baba. He came and met me while I was cleaning the car, the vehicle. He said, ah, that vehicle has been on the spot for so long. He's so dirty. Ah, I said, very soon now it will be clean. I'm cleaning it already, Baba. And he stood with me as I was cleaning it. And then he said, even after you finish cleaning it, there will be no fuel inside it again. No? Because nobody has used it for so long. I said, fuel will not be a problem. There will be a little deer that will carry me to the next filling station. So, and when I get to the next filling station, I will go and buy fuel. He shook his head. He said, that's true. That's true. And then again he said, what? You know the vehicle has been there for long. Nobody using it. So, the battery must be down. So, you will not be able to start it. I said, we can jump start it. I will jump start it. And the old man said, Usha have a big motto is Sha. You seriously want to carry this vehicle? Ah, I said, yes, Baba. I will carry it. I will carry it. What's in the King Log Bay? I will carry it. He said, okay. I will help you. I will help you. You sit inside. I will push it for you. So I sat inside. And he pushed the vehicle. I do bony, but the thing was pushed so easily. 
mo yo se fun to ba gbo bo se dun chararara to fi down ah i said this vehicle is brand new the old man laughed when i said that and he waved at me he said aro elorun o be easy for you it will be easy so i believe that men can give grace but they are not the ones giving it the holy spirit will take it from them for you i listened to uh, rian bonke tell how he received grace from jeffrey he was a student Bonke was a student from a Bible school and he was in London in transit traveling to Germany on train so he realized that he had a little time he had like about three hours before his train would be, would be taking off so he decided he wanted to move around London and see London not that he saw any revelation. Not that anybody told him anything. He just wanted to see London. So he said he entered one bus, crossed from one to another, and he was just moving around. After some time, he said, let me trek a little bit. And he came down from the bus and trekked. And as he was trekking, you know, in those countries, they will put the name of the owner of the house on the house. And he saw the name on the house, Jeffrey. And he said, ah, Jeffrey, that's the name of one of the great ministers, this evangelist that God used for miracles in Britain. He said, could it be the name, the same person? And he felt inside him, go and check. So he went to the door and knocked. He said, when he knocked the door, it was a lady that answered. And the lady said, what do you want? And he told her that he wanted to see Jeffrey. That, is it the same Jeffrey? The woman said, yes. Can I see him? And the woman said, no, 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 you can go, please. And the woman shoo him off. While he was responding to the woman, Jeffrey himself was coming down from the stairs. And he had the conversation. Said, let him come in. And so, the lady was forced to allow Bonke to come in. And he told Jeffrey who he was and what he was doing around. And Jeffrey asked him to kneel down. And he just prayed for him. And he poured grace upon him prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And uh, Bonke left. He said when he got to Germany that same day, that same day, his father told him that Jeffrey died. And he said, no, I saw him today. And they show him the news. How he died just after Bonke left. Just after Bonke left. And Bonke's grace was a reflection of the grace of Jeffrey. How much venison did Jeffrey collect from Bonke? Is it Jeffrey that wanted to do it? Did he invite Bonke? Is it Bonke that went and negotiated it? No, these are things that God does. Only God does it. So stop trying to buy grace with venison. Stop demanding venison before blessing people also. Only the Holy Spirit has the prerogative of distribution of gifts and operations. And it does it. It is not venison. There's a song I like us to sing. It's in our hymn. Before we go to pray, when we walk with the Lord, I think it should be number one. 
Uh-huh. It's number one on the pamphlet. It says, when we walk with the Lord, in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who we trust and obey. Can you rise up and sing that song together? When we walk when with the Lord In the light of His world What a glory He sheds on our way While we do His good will He abides with us still And we all who we trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. A shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but a joy that quickly Trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a body we bear. Not a sorrow we share, but a tiny dot quickly repay. Not a grief, not a loss, not a frown or a cross, but it's as if we trust and obey. No trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove. The delight of His love Until all on this altar we lay For the favor He shows And the joy He bestows Are for them who we trust And afford them no better Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship with we will sit at His feet, or we walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says we will go, never fear, only trust and trust and no trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but 
but to trust and obey. Now, before we pray, if you look at stanza four, he says, We never can prove the delight of his love until we lay everything on the altar. Until we lay everything on the altar. That is, you get to a point where nothing is more important than the Lord in your life. Then the favor he shows, the joy he bestows, will come to you because you are already trusting in him. You are ready to lay everything on the altar. I need you to pay attention to that again. You can never prove the delight of his love until you lay everything on the altar. Everything. That woman said, if I, Esther, if I perish, I perish. She was ready to lay everything on the altar. And then things began to happen. There's always a point where you have to decide. No other thing will be more important than the Lord in my life. Until you cross that threshold, He cannot trust you with His glory. He cannot trust you with His grace. Sir, in Nigeria today, God is looking for people. I'm talking of something serious now. God is looking for people. Part of the reason why Nigeria is as it is now is because there are no people praying. There were some intercessors in the past. God has rejected a lot of them now. So their intercession is meaningless to God now. A lot of them. They have failed God. He has pushed them aside. But there are no new people replacing them yet. So God is looking for men he can trust. Trusted intercessors. People who would genuinely, genuinely do it right in the sight of God. He's looking for people to promote. Let me explain to you. There are four laps to a relay race. Relay race. The first one goes. When he finishes his term, he must hand over to the next one. He can't say, I'm not tired. I will continue. He must hand over because his term has finished. The era we are in now, between November and May next year is the time of handing over. New set of people will begin to emerge to step into position of assignment in Nigeria. God is looking for who? Faithful people he can rely upon. God is looking for them. And I desire that you be one of them. So the first prayer you are going to pray. Deliver me from self-centeredness in ministry. Self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. There is no Nikon there. Self-centeredness. They me. Deliver me from self. God is looking for people who are not looking for a me. Me, 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 me. Me too, I want to be somebody. Me too, I want to. Deliver me from all this me. Me thing.
God is looking for people who will say, Him, 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 give Him the glory. I want to be available, Lord. Deliver me from self-centeredness. Deliver me from all those interests Those commitment to self Deliver me from it Deliver me from it Deliver me from self It is because of your commitment to self that makes you to be demanding that for you. Demanding venison. Demanding money. It is because of your flesh. Deliver me, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. There was a young man Who was an assistant to Elisha? You remember him? Gehazi. He had served faithfully for many, we don't know whether many years or months, but he had been, at least he had been with Elisha for some time. He was qualified to continue the assignment. And maybe he too would have taken double portion of what Elisha got. But self stopped him. Self stopped him. How can you ask me to come and sing and you will not give me offering? How can you ask me to come and preach and you are not giving me a fat offering? What he would have was more important than ministry. And he said, Lepro- he would die with leprosy. He never concluded, he never entered into that glory. Because of self. Because of self. Later, the next time we read about him, he was having a conversation with a king. I read it. They said he was in the king's palace and they were talking. And the woman that Elisha raised her son came to see the king. And it was Gehazi that was now introducing that woman. He said, this is the woman that my master delivered from. And I asked myself a question. He was a leper. He was conversing with a king in Israel. Now, if you don't know Israel, let me tell you. The moment somebody is a leper, he must not even come to town. He's supposed to be living. Not that he was healed from the leprosy, which is leprosy. The king was having conversation with him in the palace of the king, even though he was a leper. I just imagine what he would have been without that leprosy. You are going to pray. <laughs> The flesh will not stop me. Can you pray that prayer? May the flesh not stop me. Look at the glory that will have manifested in the life of Gehazi. I 
and see how he destroyed himself because of the flesh. Because of the flesh. Because of benefits. He killed himself. He destroyed the glory. Because of venison. Say, how can you come and you will not give something to the prophets? Malika Shataya Baba. The flesh will not stop me. 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 In Jesus' name we pray. You know, yesterday I read, I read to us the story of Saul. When Samuel was anointing him, he told him, as you go from here, you meet a group of people who are going to offer sacrifice. They will give you this, they will give you that. But you meet a group of prophets and you will prophesy. They will give you gifts. But that's not the important matter. You will get to the other place where you will prophesy. That one is more important. In essence, gifts are normal as you serve the Lord. People will give you gifts. But you must not be buried by the gifts. Your ministry must not be limited to gifts. You are going to pray. The grace I carry gift will not destroy it. Gift will not destroy my grace. Can you pray that prayer? Gift will not destroy my grace. In the name of Jesus. Gifts. They will give you gifts. Whether they, you like it or not. Whether they like it or not, they must give you gifts. But gift will not stop me. Gift will not hinder my ministry. Venice. In Jesus' name we pray. You are still going to take that prayer once more. The prayer is, let me not fall into the trap of gifts. I was, you know, I had an experience. Let me quickly tell you this one. I went to preach in America. And I had a number of meetings. There was one week, one one Sunday I was free. And I was in Connecticut that Sunday with my brother. And I spoke with one of my friends who is a pastor, a white man. Hey, Bemiga, how are you? And we talked. We had a good, a good, a good discussion. He said, you are in town. I said, yeah. Come and worship in our church on Sunday. I said, yeah, I'm free. I will come. Oh, and he dropped. A few minutes later, he called me. He said, why don't you bring the word? I said, I don't mind. Why don't you preach? I said, I don't mind. I'll I'll preach. 
What I didn't tell him was, before I came to Connecticut, God has given me the sermon I will preach in their church. I, I, we, he didn't invite me, so I didn't talk about it. So, but he now spoke, and I knew God had prepared me ahead. So I said, yeah, that's alright. I'll do that. How long do you, do you, do you allow for someone? He told me all of that. And then a few, maybe about an hour later, he called me back. He said, I'm confused. I don't know what to do with you now. I know you are a preacher. I know you are a missionary. I said, what's the problem? He said, in our church, if I introduce you as a missionary, everybody will give you an offering. But if I introduce you as a preacher, nobody will give you anything. And we will only give you an area. So I'm in a dilemma. Maybe I should not allow you to preach so that I can introduce you as a missionary and so that my congregation can bless you. I said, before I left Nigeria, God gave me the sermon to preach in your church. So I'm a preacher in your church. He said, you know, I told you, Americans are very straightforward. They don't do this, this for you. I told you they will not give you any offering. I said, I didn't come for offering. I came to preach. And truly I preached. At the end of my sermon, everybody was excited. They were blessed. And they greeted me so well. Nobody gave me anything. Just as their pastor said they would do. Okay? And then as I was leaving, he gave me honorarium. Should I tell you how much? Very small honorarium. The smallest honorarium I had ever in- received in the international community. The smallest. This is a big church of over 500 people. I've been in other churches that are smaller that will give me more than 20 times what they gave me. And I left the place. Giving thanks to God. The following week I went to another place. If you saw the offering they gave me. Ha! Ah, instantly I, I called for, I bought two camera, two cameras, two video cameras. From the offering one church gave me. Because it's not, I, I didn't get trapped by that gift of that other church. God opened the door for me in another place. You are going to pray. Deliver me from the trap of gifts. Gifts. Gifts will not trap my ministry. Gifts will not stop me. Search for gifts. Eh? If it doesn't work, Bokiri, could you call your bone alone? If it doesn't work, Bokiri, could you call your bone alone? If it doesn't work, Bokiri, it's Jaloma Maja. Eh, more phone, low toto. The money they gave is not enough. Eh, eh. Deliver me from that trap. In the name of Jesus. Deliver me from that trap. In the name of Jesus. Deliver me from that trap. In the name of Jesus. Deliver me from that trap. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus name we pray. Alright, the last prayer you are going to pray Teach me to walk with you I want to walk with you, Lord Teach me to walk with you Can you pray that prayer? Teach me to walk with you I want to learn to walk with you Teach me, Lord Teach me to walk with you La Kaba Sataya Valia I want to walk with you I want to walk with you, Lord Teach me to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Now pick up your pamphlet and look at the fifth stanza of that song. Look at it. It says, Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we will walk by his side in the way. That is, there are two options. Is either I am sitting at his feet to listen to him, or I will be walking by his side in the way. What he says, we will do. Where he sends, we will go. We will not fear. We will only trust and obey. That's how to work with him. So you are going to pray, use that to pray. Teach, teach me to sit at your feet. Teach me to walk by your side on the way. That I will be able to go wherever you send me. And I will be able to do whatever you ask me to do. Can you pray that prayer? Pray that prayer. Teach me, teach me, teach me. To sit at your feet, teach me, Lord. To sit at your feet, teach me. Teach me to sit at your feet. Teach me to walk by your side on the way. That I will not go ahead of you. That I will not stay behind when you are walking. 